Several big things have happened over the last 24 hours, and not just in Ukraine. However, concerning the Ukraine war, perhaps the biggest development by far is the fact that battles are now taking place within the city of Slavyansk. Slavyansk is part of the second big Ukrainian-held conurbation in Donbass. So there is the severodonetsk lysychansk conurbation, and then a few dozen kilometers west of that, there is the slavyansk kramatorsk conurbation. And this second conurbation is larger than the first in terms of population and in terms of urban area, but perhaps most notably, it marks the last big Ukrainian-held position within the entire Donbass region. Once Slavyansk, Krematorsk, and Severodonetsk, Lysychansk come under the control of the Russian and Donbass forces, Ukraine really won't have many big important positions left in the Donbass. They will have Artyomovka, Avdeyevka, but these are considerably smaller cities. They're more like towns, if anything. So, these two big conurbations represent the bulk of what Ukraine has in the entire Donbass region. I will remind everybody that Severodonetsk is, or at least the vast majority of Severodonetsk is under the control of the Russian forces. So, in summary, Ukraine has two medium-sized conurbations left in Donbass. One of these is basically halfway to being controlled by the Russian forces. The other one is under siege by Russian forces as well. Once both of these conurbations fall, Ukraine really won't have that much left in Donbass area. After that, the battles in Donbass at least will be of a much smaller scale and it'll basically just be clearing out the Ukrainian forces from the rest of these much smaller towns and villages. Now, I should note that we're not seeing the battle take place within the city itself, at least not yet. We're not seeing any kind of massive offensive trying to take the entire city of Slavyansk. Rather, we're seeing small battles beginning to erupt on the city outskirts and in the various villages that are located right on the doorstep to Slavyansk. At any rate, the battle, the operation to retake Slavyansk has officially begun. So that's more or less the summary of the situation. Now, with this in mind, I want you to take a look at what the British Ministry of Defense is saying about this. The same British Ministry of Defense, which I made a video about some weeks ago, talking about how it's just ridiculously disconnected from reality. Anyways, take a look at this. The second point says, Russia's progress on the Izium front has stalled since April. So according to the British Ministry of Defense, Russia has made zero progress on the Izium front since the month of April, since two months ago. Now, I find it sweetly ironic that on the exact same day, mere hours after this update came out, sources within the Donetsk People's Republic reported that there was fighting taking place over Slavyansk. Russian forces and Donbass forces have advanced on Slavyansk from the north. So when we're talking about the advance on Slavyansk, we are talking about the Izium front. Several days ago, the town of Svetogorsk was also captured by Russian forces without even so much as a fight. Apparently, the Ukrainians have abandoned all of their positions in Svetogorsk several days earlier. According to reports that I've heard, a large amount of Ukrainian equipment, vehicles, were captured. So, we're clearly seeing this front, well, perhaps not collapsing, but we are clearly seeing the Ukrainian forces 
actively retreating on this front. And this is not new. This has been going on for a while. The public has known for a while. This has been public information, publicly available information for weeks and weeks now that Russian forces are making steady progress along the Izium front. How deluded does the Ministry of Defense of an entire country, a country that was quite recently a superpower and is still viewed by the majority of the world as perhaps not a full superpower, but something very close to a superpower, a country that was once known for its immaculate, practically omniscient intelligence, for having one of the best, perhaps even the best intelligence services in the entire world during the Second World War, during the Cold War. How has it come to this, that the intelligence services of this country are now reporting something that is diametrically opposite to the truth and something that the entire world has known is diametrically opposite to the truth for several months. Either this British intelligence from which we are reading these reports has only recently come into our universe from some parallel mirror universe where the events unfolding on the ground in Ukraine are completely different from what we're seeing in our own universe, or British intelligence services are really just this ideologically brainwashed and downright incompetent, or they're just straight up lying, in which case they shouldn't be called the intelligence services, they should be called the propaganda services, because intelligence is not what they do. Intelligence is something that is completely independent of ideology. It is something that is completely independent of what one person or another wants to see. The job of intelligence is to report what is actually happening. Now, if I were to guess, I would say that this is likely due to a combination of both of the last two factors. I think that this is both a combination of the extreme religious ideological worship, the ideological dogma that evidently has reached as far as the British intelligence services, at least to some extent. I am certain that there are many much more competent people within the British intelligence services who are probably reporting different information to at least some important people who make the decisions within the government, in which case these reports that we, the common people, get to see are nothing but propaganda reports. They're not intelligence in any way, shape, or form. They are nothing but wishful propaganda. Also, as some people on Telegram have commented, something which I found quite funny, Every single one of these bullet points uses the word likely at least once. It's as if these intelligence, quote-unquote, intelligence services really don't have a clue as to what's going on. They can only know what is likely happening. They can't deliver any actual solid concrete information. It's just Russia has likely lost a trillion men near Kiev, Ukraine is likely winning the war. Zelensky is likely a war hero. Anyways, now that I'm done taking a piss at these British propaganda updates, one more thing that I'm going to mention about Slavyansk Kramatorsk is that it's not only a militarily important objective in the sense that it is one of the last lines of Ukraine's defense in the entire Donbass region, not only in the fact that it's one of these big conurbations that Ukraine still holds in the Donbass region, but also because it was the place where the Donbass forces suffered a very big and symbolic defeat back during the fighting in 2014, when the Ukrainian army led an assault on these cities 
to capture them from the then unrecognized Donbass republics. So a lot of people on the ground are seeing this conurbation. In fact, both of these conurbations, both Slavyansk, Kramatorsk and Severodonetsk, Lysychansk, as areas which aren't just militarily important, but are also symbolically very important. The second big piece of news that we've received is that the government of Nicaragua has essentially allowed the Russian military to use its territory. Nicaragua has included Russia in the list of countries which are able to send soldiers to Nicaragua for humanitarian purposes, soldiers and also warships. On the one hand, I think that this is a pretty big and important development because the United States has this Monroe Doctrine going on where no country can intervene in the entire hemisphere that the United States is essentially located in. The United States considers all of Latin and South America as its sphere of influence, as its backyard, and it doesn't want anyone meddling there. Let us remember the fact that the United States almost started World War III over the fact that the Soviets deployed missiles to Cuba, or rather were in the process of deploying nuclear-capable missiles to Cuba as a direct response to the much more capable and more numerous American nuclear-capable missiles that were already deployed to Turkey and Europe at the time. So the last time that the Russians made any big military deployment to this part of the world, World War III almost erupted. Now, this doesn't look like it's going to be a big military deployment anytime soon. The Nicaraguan government has explicitly stated that the Russian military is only allowed to essentially deploy its troops to Nicaragua for humanitarian purposes, something which the United States and many other countries in the region, by the way, are also allowed to do. So, frankly speaking, Russia isn't going to be building any nuclear-capable missile silos in Nicaragua anytime soon. And even if Russia were to do something like that, I don't think that it would really change anything because both sides have intercontinental ballistic missiles, which are very accurate, very powerful, and available in large numbers, something that was not the case during the Cuban Missile Crisis. So the need for shorter range missiles is not as great now as it was 60 years ago during the Cuban Missile Crisis. However, something is telling me that Russia's attempts to create some kind of a military foothold, to have some kind of a military presence in Latin America or in South America isn't going to end here. I think that this news, as well as the entire war that is happening in Ukraine, have to be taken in the context of the negotiations that were happening between Russia and the United States, between Russia and NATO, back in December and January, when Russia made its ultimatum to NATO to either draw back its military presence, to withdraw its military assets to the countries and territories that were held by NATO before the 1997 NATO expansion. So basically, to withdraw NATO's military to where it was during the Cold War, without actually relinquishing any of the promises made to any current NATO countries under Article 5. It is very clear now, and perhaps not at all unexpected, that the United States and NATO categorically refused this ultimatum. As a result, we have the Ukraine war, that is, without a doubt, one of the big reasons for why the Ukraine war took off. Of course, there are many others. But also, it seems that Russia is trying to essentially meddle in America's traditional sphere of influence, in America's traditional quote-unquote 
backyard as a response to the fact that the United States and NATO are drawing closer and closer to Russia, therefore meddling in Russia's quote-unquote backyard, so Russia is trying to do the same to the United States. Anyways, I'm sure that we will hear more about this particular development with Nicaragua and Russia. After all, we should not forget that only back in September, there were a series of negotiations and agreements that were reached between the ministries of defense of Russia and Nicaragua, and it appears that this recent development, that the Russians are now allowed to deploy their soldiers to Nicaragua, is either one of the agreements that was reached, or that it is some sort of a development, a follow-up to whatever was reached, whatever agreements were reached between the two countries back in September. If this is indeed the case, which it most likely is, then we are seeing what looks to be a trend of an increasing Russian military influence in Nicaragua, and five or ten years down the line, this could very well be followed up by an increasing Russian military presence in Latin and South America. At least, the potential for that is there. Possibly, China will also be included in the list of countries that are allowed to deploy its military to Nicaragua. If something like that ever happens, that will be a much bigger development than only Russia being allowed to deploy its military, which isn't to say that the Russian military is less powerful or has less reach than the Chinese military, but rather that China is the main geopolitical adversary of the United States right now, not Russia, and also that both of the United States' two big traditional adversaries being essentially allowed to deploy their militaries to Nicaragua as opposed to just one military being allowed to do so is going to send a much clearer signal. So I think that it's a smart idea to wait and see if anything else comes of this, either in Nicaragua or any other Latin slash South American countries, and to see if Russia or China start gaining a bigger military presence in this part of the world anytime soon. And the final thing that I would like to talk about today is the fact that three foreign mercenaries, two British mercenaries and one Moroccan mercenary, who were fighting for the Ukrainian side in the Ukraine war, who have been captured by the Russian military. From what I understand, all three of these mercenaries were captured at Azovstal. These mercenaries have now been tried by a court within the Donetsk People's Republic, and they have been sentenced to death by firing squad. The names of these mercenaries are Sean Penner, Aidan Aslin, and Rahim Sadun. The British mainstream media has already reacted to the fact that these mercenaries were tried and sentenced to death. Unsurprisingly, the narrative is that this was just a kangaroo court, but then I feel that I should remind everybody that only a few weeks ago the media narrative was that this surrender that took place at Azovstal, this surrender by the Ukrainian and foreign mercenary contingent, was in fact not a surrender at all, that it was all actually some sort of elaborate planned evacuation. And here we are, a few weeks later, witnessing the results of that planned evacuation. Some evacuation that was. And also, unsurprisingly, but perhaps somewhat interestingly, is the fact that none of these articles mention the words Donetsk People's Republic or Lugansk People's Republic. All of these articles essentially make it seem that these mercenaries were tried and sentenced to death by the Russian military, by Russian-controlled forces. Now, to be fair, we shouldn't pretend that the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republic 
aren't acting in lockstep with Russia. After all, another little bit of news that we've received over the last 24 hours is that some of the government officials within these republics have retired and their positions have been taken over by politicians from Russia. So these entities are acting in complete lockstep with one another, at least when it comes to things relating to foreign policy, economics, domestic policy. But the courts are at least somewhat independent and separate within these republics. That is to say, the court within the Donetsk People's Republic isn't exactly the same as the court in Russia. The death penalty has been, after all, abolished in Russia, but it hasn't been abolished within the Donetsk People's Republic. And frankly, while I understand that the British media may not be happy about the fact that British citizens are being publicly tried and sentenced to death in another country, let's not pretend that this wasn't deserved or that these mercenaries didn't know exactly what they were doing when they signed a contract, when they took money to go and fight in a foreign country in a war that doesn't concern them in any way, shape, or form. All three of these mercenaries have the option to appeal their sentence within the next 30 days. If they choose to appeal, which they certainly will, if their appeal is accepted, the best fate that can possibly await them is 25 years in a high security prison, so not exactly enviable either. But hey, at least it's not a life sentence. However, as some people on the internet have already pointed out, their appeal will likely not be accepted for the simple fact that the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics, as well as Russia, all need some kind of gesture, something to indicate to the rest of the world, to all of the other thousands and thousands of mercenaries that are already in Ukraine and to the tens of thousands of people who want to go to Ukraine to fight against Russia on Ukraine's side, that if they choose to do so, they will not receive any mercy from the Russian military, from the Russian government, or from the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics. This is something that the Russian military spokesperson, Igor Konashenkov, openly said during the first several days of the war. But as we know, statements by themselves don't really mean much. If those statements are backed up by some sort of precedent, they are going to be heard much more clearly by the other side. And frankly, I might add that as soon as it became public knowledge that all of these individuals who are accused of various crimes, of mercenarism, of supporting or being part of far-right organizations such as the Azov Battalion, Right Sector, and so on, as soon as we heard that all of these people are going to be tried, not in Russia, but in the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republic, and once we learned that their fates will be in the hands not of Russian prosecutors, but of prosecutors that come from the very territory that has been shelled and waged war against for eight years, I think that that was when it became perfectly clear that all of these individuals who are accused of these various crimes are going to be handed down heavy, heavy sentences. That said, on a personal note, I would like to add that I don't feel any ill intent towards any of these individuals. That's just me. It's kind of difficult to actually look at somebody who's in this hopeless, desperate position, who is as broken as all of these mercenaries are, when they understand that they are going to be almost certainly executed by a firing squad. But then again, it's not like they aren't guilty of if not all of the crimes that they are being accused of, at the very least, the crime of mercenarism. 
One final note about this topic, something that I found more humorous than something that actually holds any substance. Some people have actually suggested exchanging these mercenaries for Julian Assange. I don't think that's going to happen for a number of reasons. First of all, none of these people are held in any high regard. Their lives do not hold any value to any of the British or American establishment politicians. We have to remember that Liz Truss was actually trying to egg people on to go to Ukraine to fight for Ukraine against the Russian military. It's not like all of these politicians didn't know that this would be the outcome. They all knew perfectly well that this was going to be the outcome. They just didn't care. They don't care about the lives of what they see as common plebs, as opposed to Julian Assange, who is an important political prisoner for both the United States and the United Kingdom. Now, the second reason that I would probably state off the top of my head is that the United States simply isn't going to allow the United Kingdom to perform this prisoner exchange. They will try to prevent it through every bit of soft power that they have available, which they do have a lot of over the United Kingdom. They will try to prevent that prisoner exchange. So long story short, no prisoner exchange is going to happen. The mercenaries will almost certainly be sentenced to death. And it's kind of sad if you think about it, but this was the inevitable outcome. And it's hard to say that this is unjust. So that's about all for now. These are the big developments that have taken place over the last 24 hours. I expect that there will be more developments taking place on the ground in Ukraine within the next few days, likely around the slavyansk kramatorsk conurbation, also likely around the city of Lysychansk, the only remaining city within the Severodonetsk-Lysychansk conurbation that's still under Ukrainian control, if you don't count the 10 or 20 percent of the industrial part of Severodonetsk, which is still controlled by Ukrainian forces. Lysychansk is the last important city, the last important area within this conurbation that's being controlled by Ukrainian forces. Anyways, long story short, there will be more developments soon, and when we hear of these developments, I will also be making videos covering them. Thank you all for taking the time to watch this video. Thank you for all of the love and support that this channel has been receiving. I wish you all the best. Take care.